Go ahead and open in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. You say, but pastor, we finished chapter 3 last week. Well, we'll, you know, pick up the last... We'll pick up the last couple of verses as we continue on into chapter 4. Um, <clears throat> hearing papers turning. So, um, as we... Get ready to look into this passage, which I think is actually a really great passage. One thing that's fun is um, Paul likes to make his points, and he likes to make them over and over again. Um, I, I'm guessing that he probably was a Southern Baptist, because the way he just uses, you know, well, this analogy and that analogy and this example and that illustration, um, he's really good at that. Um, of course, we know that Jesus was a Southern Baptist, right, because he was baptized in Southern Judea. <laughs> by John the Baptist, just saying, right? Okay. <laughs> What's that? And fully immersed. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I wonder if we got any people watching start a fight with that one. Um, all right. Well, let's go ahead and read uh, Galatians uh, starting in verse 3, 28 through 4, verse 7. So there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So, <clears throat> as we've been looking through Galatians, the, the main point that he's writing his letter, or at least the thing that kicked it off, the reason he started writing the letter, the main point he's trying to address is that there were these false teachers who had come in and they were leading the Galatians astray into legalism, saying that you had to follow this set of rules. And specifically, it was referring to the Old Testament law of Moses. They'd come in and said, you must first be Jewish before you can be Christian. See, God gave us all of this. And if you want to follow God, well, then you must follow all of this as well. And so they're putting the burden of the law on the Galatians, and Paul has been going through different arguments about why that is actually a false gospel and is not the case. So let's go back and let's look at this. Verse 28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I'm not going to go back and re-preach previous sermons. However, if you remember, it's referring to this promise made to Abraham that there would be one of his seed, singular, referring to Christ, who would be a blessing to all the nations. And this was an uh, inference to the gospel that would get fleshed out by later prophets and then, of course, whenever Christ himself came. But what's interesting is you look at this... Um, one thing we have to see, we have to understand, and it drives me crazy the way people want to talk about these things nowadays. Your group identity or your social status on earth gets you nothing in the kingdom of God. It is one of the most irrelevant things about you. We all share in the same promise. We all receive the same inheritance. What do you have to do in order to get an inheritance? Nothing. You don't do anything. Somebody dies and they give you stuff. An inheritance, you're the passive party. You don't actually do anything to receive that. You don't earn it. You don't do anything of merit. You just get it by virtue of the fact that you're the heir. Likewise, you cannot earn God's grace. You cannot earn salvation. You are a passive party to the transaction. You get it simply because 
If you are in Christ, you are an heir. Chapter 4, verse 1. <clears throat> He says, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave. Though he is master of all, but is under the guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Doesn't matter the status of the parent and even the status the child themselves will one day assume and the possessions they will one day have whenever they're a child, they're still no different than a slave. They're no different than any of the servants. My dad owned a construction company. And it would be silly, I'll use that word, for me to go onto a job site and be like, my dad's the boss here, so you need to start doing that, and you need to do that, and start bossing everybody around like I was in charge because, you know, my dad, he's the boss here. Of course, you may know some people who behave that way. But it's not actually the case because what would happen if I, as a child, walk onto the job site and start to try to boss everybody around? They're going to say, get lost, kid. Actually, what happens is whenever I would be on the job site, um, even though my dad runs this place. What I was getting told was, you can't go in there, you can't touch that, leave that alone, where's your hard hat, what are you doing? No, don't do that. Everyone else got to tell me what to do. Didn't matter who I was, because I was just a child. <clears throat> even a prince, even though one day they will rule the empire, and when they're a child, they're just a child. People who are actually slaves get to boss them around and tell them what to do. Verse 3. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. And I want to say a bit about this term, the elements of the world. What's interesting is um, it is often taken to mean uh, kind of the, the baser things of this fallen world, right? It gets referring to our sinful flesh. Chances are I've probably actually taught this verse like that in the past, um, talking about our bondage to sin. And that, that could be an application, but what's interesting is as I was reading and looking and studying for this message, <clears throat> I think what might be at play here is a case of a good message from a wrong verse. Sometimes we can take a passage or a verse and we can pull it out of context and it sounds really good and it sounds kind of like this other thing we believe and it's true and it's right and it's good. But that verse isn't really talking about that. And so sometimes we can make connections where connections don't belong. What actually seems likely is that this is just a reference to being under the societal rules. The, the, the rules of the world, of the society, of the culture that you are being raised under. As we'll see in verse 4 and 5, they mention uh, being under the law, and there seems to be a parallel in this reference. And so if this here is referring to the law of Moses, well, then it can't be referring to our sinful flesh. Recall the main issue that Paul is addressing with the Galatians is the false teaching that they are supposed to be following the law and adhere to the law. So it makes sense that this would also be referring to that. He just uses the same uh, meaning the same thing, but with a bunch of different ways of wording it. And they were under the law before Jesus came. But when Jesus came, everything changed. Look at verse 4. It says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And so, j just as a child is under guardians and nannies and teachers and servants, right? That they will grow up to be a point where, okay, well, now they become an adult. They become a, a son. They become an heir. They, they receive authority. And so the law was serving as that function, but now Christ has come, and you have a change one thing that's interesting whenever it talks about the fullness of time, I'll often hear people uh, talk about, well, why did Jesus come when he came? Like, if he came now, it could be on video. We could just put that out to the world and there'd be no denying it. Here it is, God in the flesh doing miracles and proclaiming his word. And we could have it all over YouTube and it'd be great. Well, one issue with that is, as we all know, that kind of thing can be faked. Especially nowadays with the technology they have. I mean, you can go to some of these AI generators and be like, I want a video of, uh, you know, so-and-so uh, doing a backflip. And, you know, it's like, boom, there's your video. Um, and it just makes it. So 
One, that would be easily fakeable. But two, what's really, really interesting, whenever you look at the time whenever Jesus did actually come, there had been several things that had taken place. Now, do we know really why God chose that time for Jesus to come? No. We're not told exactly why. However, there are these interesting things that took place leading up to that time. For starters, you had the Babylonian exile where the Jews were carried off into captivity. And so whenever they came back, they had learned their lesson. The Jews at the time, whenever Jesus comes on the scene, they are so ravenously zealous for God and only God that there are no idols allowed in Israel. I mean, idolatry, nowhere on the table. They're focused on God. Of course, they went overboard into legalism with it. But you have a people who are prepared to receive something. They're focused on God, not all these other religions and practices. And then you have Alexander the Great comes through and he conquers the area. And most of the Mediterranean and uh, Middle East, he conquers and they all start speaking Greek. And so you have one unified common language where all these disparate people groups are now speaking and writing the same language. And then comes Rome, and they conquer. And Rome builds roads and actually secures travel and trade so that you can go throughout the empire around the region relatively safely and quickly. And so Jesus comes on the scene, and now here you have the gospel message to be spread, and there's roads by which to spread it. That There are a people who are zealous wanting to hear the things of God, who are ready to hear them, even though many of them don't, it still sprouts out of Judaism so that now this gospel message can go out throughout the empire on roads and relative safety and ease of travel, carrying a message in a language that virtually everybody is speaking, reading, and writing. So, seemed like a relatively good time for Jesus to come. Now, do we know that? Could get to heaven and God goes, you were way off base. That had nothing to do with it, possibly. But seems to make some sense. <clears throat> so just as a child is under the authority of others until the time comes that they receive their inheritance as a son, so the Jews were kept under the authority of the law until the time came for Jesus. And of course, the promise isn't just for the Jews, but for all who would repent and put their faith in Christ. And if you've received Christ's gift of grace and forgiveness, then you are adopted sons and daughters of God. Verse 6, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son, Jesus, into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. What a great picture of the gift of grace that we receive through Christ. When you think about this picture, that, that as a child, you have overseers who are raising you, the, the law then is comparable to a nanny. There it was, helping along, but then the time came that you're no longer under the authority of a caregiver. No longer under your teachers and your guardians. Now, here's an interesting thing, because people who hear this will go, no, 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 this is God's word. You cannot throw that away. It is wonderful and great, and you should follow it. It's like, okay, now, now stop. All of us, as we were children, have had teachers, mentors, babysitters, coaches, Right? People who were good, godly, wonderful people who spoke wisdom and good lessons into our lives while we were under their authority. Now, let's imagine, let's use a coach as an example. Right, You're playing sports, you've got a coach, they're a great coach, they teach you all kinds of wonderful things and help you become the person that you are. Okay, well fast forward years later, you're no longer on the team, they're no longer your coach. Are you under their authority? No, because you're not on their team. But what about the lessons they taught you? Does that mean the lessons are irrelevant and don't matter and you can just throw them away? No, 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 they're, they're still right, they're still good, they're still true. 
but it's a matter of authority. You're no longer under their authority. And so we see the word of God. We see the law that was given. We see the wisdom and the morality that is contained within and the lessons it has to offer. And absolutely, yes, amen. Let's study and learn from it. But that was the old covenant. Jesus brought in the new. It's a matter of the authority. What authority are we under? <clears throat> But now we are sons and daughters of God. And it says that if we are sons, then we are heirs. So what is the inheritance? In a word, the easy way to say it, our inheritance is heaven. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, it means we get to go where God wipes away every tear where there is no more suffering and no more death. We get to go where the greatest material value, the substance that are things that on earth people died and killed for, is of such menial value, we use it as asphalt on the roads, right? Because the Bible says there will be streets of gold, whereas here people fight and kill over it there, yeah, we it's pavement. So amazing is the value of heaven. It's where we get to get to live the lives that God had initially designed and created us for before sin derailed mankind. If we put it into context, I mean, just look at the overarching story. Sometimes we grab a thing and we want to focus it on so much we forget where it appears in the overall picture of what is going on. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration, right? That God creates mankind to be his earthly family to join with him in basically the family business of creation, of bringing order out of chaos. Right? He creates the garden amidst the wilderness of the world, and he says, here, tend and keep this garden, the goodness, the order, the peace of Eden. Tend it and keep it. And then go subdue and have dominion over all the earth. That is, go out into the wilderness and tame the wilderness, bringing the peace and order of Eden to the world. Well, we decided we didn't want to do that. So mankind went and did something else. But then as we are brought back into the family of God, we rejoin the family business. We were created to be a people who work with and serve God as stewards over his creation creating goodness and order and harmony and peace. <clears throat> and so, promises, we get brought back into God's family. Here's the thing about family. You're always welcome. Family is always welcome. Even your crazy uncle gets to come to family reunion. Right? Even if you roll your eyes, oh, there he is again. Well, he's still invited because he's family. Even your cousin who only ever invites you to lunch so they can try to sell you on their new multi-level marketing scheme that they've joined, you still go to lunch because they're family. Under the law, it's easy to be alone. Well, it's just about keeping the rules. You know, I'll just do whatever I want, check off my religious to-do list. But in Christ, we come together. I've used the example before. Yeah, we can be spread all over the place in all kinds of different ways, alone and separated from one another, but whenever Christ is our center, as we come closer to him, we draw closer to one another. And the deeper we drink of his grace and forgiveness, the more we extend grace to others, especially other Christians. Because you're family. I mean, you're kind of weird. Well, let's face it, you're a little messed up. Let's not even talk about what you did in college. Not to mention last week when you thought no one was looking. We'll just, we won't even bring that up. I mean, let's admit it. You're a little bit of a mess, ain't you? But so are the rest of us. And we have been forgiven by grace and adopted into the family of God through faith in Christ. And so if that's you, that you have repented of your sin, turn from that life, trust it in Christ, 
for the forgiveness and grace that he offers through the cross and the resurrection, then your family. Welcome. Glad you're here. Hope you'll stay for lunch. You know, if you're not, even if you're just playing church, you've never really trusted Christ, we're still glad you're here. Pull up a chair. Glad to have you. But know that you too can share in the inheritance of God. That the invitation is open to all who would repent of their sin and trust in Christ and therefore be adopted into the family of God. That little church on Liberty Hill Come praise the Lord, let your cup be filled Raise your voices and we'll sing Let God's freedom ring from that little church on Liberty.